Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are going to um, get started with our Colorado Crisis Services webinar. And our presenters for this afternoon is uh, the first presenter is Mary Hepler. She is the Manager of Crisis Services at the Office of Behavioral Health, which is part of the Colorado Department of Human Services. Our second presenter is Deanna Ryerson, and she is the Colorado Crisis Respons Response System Director in the Northeast. And our third presenter is Mike Tapp, and he is the Director of Crisis Services at Aurora Mental Health Center. And our final presenter is Marissa Van Dover, who is the Program Manager of the 24-7 Walk-In Crisis Center at Mental Health Center of Denver. And I am your host. I am the Primary Care Medical Provider Network Manager here at Colorado Access. And Colorado Access has three of the seven uh, RICO, uh, Regional Care Collaborative Organization regions which is part of the Colorado Medicaid Accountable Care Collaborative Program. And our intent today was to bring our physical health providers who participate in the ACC program and our behavioral health um, BHO partners and behavioral health providers together to learn more about the Colorado Crisis Services. So in terms of participation guidelines, um, please mute your phones. Uh, we do have a presenter who is, is remote, so I cannot mute all the lines as she will not be able to speak to us. So please mute your phones individually. If you do not have a mute button, please press star six um, in your chat window. I also sent a little message as well to that effect. And the recording of this webinar will be made available hopefully within the next two to four weeks, and we'll post it to our private website. And what we typically do is following this webinar, everybody who was confirmed as a participant will receive a copy of the slides as well as the link to the recording. Now in terms of our webinar objectives, we hope that following this webinar, you'll be able to describe what Colorado Crisis Services provides, explain how Colorado Crisis Services works, describe how Colorado Crisis Services builds upon existing resources, identify what is a consumer-facing service versus a referred service, decide when to call 911 versus when to call Colorado Crisis Services, as well as demonstrate how to utilize Colorado Crisis Services within your practice. Um, for example, that includes maybe updating your contact list and your emergency contact information. So our agenda, just to give you a high-level overview of how the webinar will proceed, we'll start with an overview of the crisis services in Colorado, and then we'll move into our regional perspective. So we'll go through RICO Region 2, which is the northeast part of Colorado, Region 3, which is the south Denver metro area, Adams, Arapahoe, Douglas County, and then we'll conclude with Region 5, which is Denver County. And just real quick, I'd like to take two quick polls before we begin. Um, so please identify what organization you represent. All right, so from the responses that we have so far, um, we have about 55 total responses, and majority of the folks on the phone or on the webinar participating are either physical health providers, a few are behavioral health, um, one represented from advocacy, um, a couple from our state agencies and other RICO organizations and then the majority of them are split between the other category and community-based organizations. And the next poll is just to assess your familiarity with the Colorado Crisis Services. Wonderful, so this looks like majority of the people are somewhat familiar um, with this, and for those of you who don't know what it is or are not familiar, we hope that we can help push you along um, to more of the somewhat familiar slash so very familiar category by the end of our webinar. All right, and now we begin with the presentation portion. I'd like to introduce Mary Hepler. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk first a little bit of, to provide an overview of Colorado Crisis Services. And I believe the first slide, we're just waiting for the slide to go forward. There we go. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Senate Bill 13266, which really provided the platform for these um, statewide crisis response services and where that comes from. Basically, 13266 really came out of the aftermath of the Aurora Theater shootings. And at that point, the governor decided to convene a, co convene a commission to really look at what this crisis response looked like in the state of Colorado. And from that commission and that report, we really found a lot of um, not there wasn't a lot of continuity of care for the folks of Colorado that were in crisis, needing to go through crisis stabilization, and then really coming out of that with some sort of a care plan. So 13266 really had some key components. The first one was there would be no wrong door. The legislation created funding, which was about $25.5 million annually, um, that's the annual appropriation, to create a statewide, 24-hour statewide crisis and support line. 
It also created what we're calling crisis walk-in centers and crisis stabilization units, as well as enhancing mobile crisis services throughout the state and providing what we're calling crisis respite services, both residential and in home. So let me just talk a little bit about the hotline. So there is a statewide hotline and warm line, and what that basically means, and you need to tell your folks this, this hotline is accessible to anyone, including physical health providers. The example that I'm going to use is you're sitting in your office, someone is reporting um, an asthma problem, but they're also mentioning that they've been increasingly depressed. They may even tell you that they have some vague suicidal thoughts. At that point, you're not required to do some big psychiatric assessment. You as a provider could call the 844 number, talk to that clinician and say, listen, I have Joe in my office. He's reporting some suicidal thoughts. Can you talk to him? At that point, that interface with the hotline clinician, they could decide to send out a mobile clinician to do an assessment, or if it is some type of rescue, dispatch 911. The real point is trying to have clinicians available to first responders, law enforcement, um, medical practitioners, behavioral health providers, as a conduit to see what is really the appropriate intervention for someone that might be having some sort of behavioral health crisis. So the hotline, an important thing to know and to tell your people is that when you call the 844 number, it does not ring. You will get an outgoing message just saying, please, saying, please stay on the phone to speak to a trained professional. All the practitioners or clinicians on the phone either have a master's degree or they have a doctorate. Some of them licensed, some of them not licensed. If an individual would like to speak to a peer specialist, they would hit the pound or hashtag sign. And currently the warm line is operated between 7 a.m. and 11 to p.m. It is not 24 hours at this time. And a consumer can also always leave a message for a peer specialist to call them back the next day, or they can stay on the line and automatically get connected to a, a clinician after hours on the warm line. So the hotline warm line went live on August 1st, and they were managing about 185 calls a day after it went live. When Robin Williams completed suicide, those calls spiked to about 3.30 to 3.35, 3.35 a day. And then it went back down to about 250 calls by the end of the year. The hotline, the goal is they can manage about 500 calls a day when they're at capacity. And the goal was to have 30% of those calls managed by peer specialists. And they have met that goal. So when you're looking at data that's coming out of the hotline, 30% of callers are going right over to the peer specialist. And that is a wonderful thing. Um, the other piece to keep in mind is that this crisis line, nowhere do we define what crisis is because everyone really sees their crisis differently than mine or yours. So we, don't, we tell people you don't have to be on fire to pick up the phone and talk to someone. Um, the hotline is, manages close to 70% of the callers, their needs are managed on the phone. And what I mean by that is less than 30% end up in a rescue, a 911 type of call, or a CPS call, or APS call, or other type of urgent intervention, even a mobile, a mobile dispatch. So about 70% of callers' needs are met on the phone in less than 10 minutes, and that is even less than the national average. And obviously the hotline is free, it is a toll-free number, there is nothing connected cost-wise, and that is obviously a consumer-facing um, consumer service. The other consumer-facing delivery service in the crisis response are the 24-hour, seven-day-a-week walk-in crisis centers. If you guys were go to go to the website at some point, you will see on a map all the locations throughout the state that provide 24-7 um, crisis evaluation. So that practitioner at these crisis centers, it is first decided, does this person need a full evaluation? And there will be a clinician there that can provide that assessment and then decide on the appropriate level of care. So those 24-hour, seven-day-a-week locations are consumer-facing, um, and they are located throughout the state. The pieces that are not consumer facing are the crisis stabilization beds. So some of the walk-in centers are also crisis stabilization units. So the CSUs, as we refer them to, also have the walk-in piece where they can do an assessment. And if someone needs 
a higher level of care. Let's say they don't need to go to a locked psychiatric facility, but could manage in a secured facility, which is what the CSUs are. These are not locked, like acute treatment units. These are secured. Um, they are 2765 designated, and all that means is that they are able to accept people on holds, initiate mental health holds, and also vacate holds. If someone is needing a crisis stabilization bed, that person can stay there up to five days. And obviously they can be on a hold for three of those days, but someone can be there from one to five days. What happens at that type of level of intervention is they will see a psychiatrist in, le in 24 hours or less. They will also have very assertive case management to see what is really preventing this person from going home. What services, what type of support are they needing in order to go back home? The, uh, now these have to be people going to these beds. It has to be a referral from a crisis services clinician. So as a private practitioner or somebody working for another type of agency, you cannot directly refer someone to a crisis stabilization bed. However, maybe a mobile practitioner will come out to your site or maybe that consumer can get to a 24-7 crisis center and have an assessment there. But it does have to come from the crisis services clinician. The other piece that the legislation created is um, crisis respite services. And I can tell you that for Adults, these typically are out-of-home placements. For our children and adolescents, most of the contractors have said, have said we would like to very much keep kids at home, if at all possible, and do in-home respite support to really keep that child in a home, in a home-based setting, if at all appropriate. If, if there's any concern about the child's safety, the capability of the caregiver, the parent, the guardian, then obviously that child or adolescent would need some services outside of home. So crisis respite services are peer or paraprofessionally managed. An individual being referred to crisis respite has to be a voluntary patient or a voluntary consumer. No one on a mental health hold would be referred to crisis respite. And crisis respite beds are available from 1 to 14 days, again with clinical case management oversight to see really what is preventing this person from being able to go home, what type of support or services does this individual need? The other piece about crisis respite that is important to keep in mind is that these are consumers that, that are able to somehow articulate what has happened to them, what is destabilizing in their life right now that they are needing additional support. It is also someone that can manage house rules. The example that I always give is no smoking in bed, nor can you bring your four therapy cats with you. So it is really important to keep in mind that the individual has to have also the ability to manage their ADLs, so their activities of daily living, and again have some, not a ton, but some insight into what happened that was destabilizing. So these services went live throughout the state on December 1st. So we don't even have a full six months of data showing how things are going, what's working, what's not working. What I can tell you about mobile services, the data that I recently saw, is close to 60% of people that are being assessed by a mobile clinician or a mobile practitioner are not being transported. No transport is necessary to an ER um, or a higher level of care. And that is really the goal. When you look at a mobile assessment and someone is in crisis and can be seen at school, at church, even at home, a boys and girls club, and they don't have to go somewhere else, that means that's a good intervention because so much trauma is created for people around, you know, when three squad cars, two fire trucks show up at your home or at church or at school, that is pretty traumatizing for that individual that's in crisis and also for the family. Nobody needs, you know, everybody's smartphone recording the interaction. So part of crisis services also has a significant piece of being trauma-informed. Anything we can do to not have to put somebody in handcuffs, in the back of a police car, to an ER, in restraints, when we can do that, that is always preferred. It doesn't mean that everyone can go to a walk-in center, and that's the other piece that we'll talk about um, Obviously, some people with acute medical issues. The other thing about a walk-in crisis center, there is a nurse, a nurse practitioner, somebody that will do maybe a drug screen, check some vital signs, but acute medical issues, things like 
unmanaged diabetes, necrotic feet from not taking care of one's diabetes, um, GI bleed, not being oriented, not being able to walk. Those are all conditions that likely most definitely will need to go to an emergency department to see what is going on. Does this person have a closed head injury? Is this person's glucose 500? Why don't they know who they are, where, where they are, or what's going on? And those are some benchmarks that we talk to law enforcement about. Because again, the old culture is you call 911, someone gets put on a hold, and you go to the ER. This system is really the hope is that down the road that it takes some burden out of the emergency departments for people that don't have acute medical issues. Now, if someone is combative, uncooperative, not in behavioral control, that person also is not going to be appropriate for a CSU or a walk-in center. Again, the, the walk-in centers typically are... Um, <coughs> Mental health centers, these are not secured facilities with restraint and seclusion. Crisis stabilization units are secured but not locked. So it's really important to, to figure out what type of milieu and what level of care is going to meet the consumer's needs. Um, again, our website is a very user-friendly website. I'd encourage all of you to go to that. But again, when in doubt, just call the number. It is, a, it is one long, simple page that basically tells people if you're not really sure, just call. So those, those phone folks should be able to direct a consumer, a family member, um, a nurse practitioner, you know, a physician in the community that's dealing with someone, typically when the response would be, oh my God, you said you have suicidal thoughts, we're going to call 911. If that person is able to sit in your office or be with you, call the 844 number and see if they can dispatch a mobile practitioner or if it truly is a 911 thing. Um, is there another slide? Time for questions. Oh, I guess, you know, I spoke very fast. Are there any questions specifically related to the hotline or the other services? Are there mobile services statewide? Yes, there are mobile services statewide. So the contractors, how it broke down was into regions. So the Denver metro area, everywhere from sort of Douglas, you know, includes Boulder, Adams County, and kind of the in-between, that area is covered mobily. But all the other regions, the southern part of Colorado, the western slope, as well as the nor northeast region as well. So yes, mobile can be dispatched throughout the state. And what I can tell you is that in an urban area, the mobile response is one hour or less. And in rural and more frontier areas, it is two hours or less. And again, we're trying to educate people about what really is 911 and when maybe is more of a mobile outreach more appropriate. So yes, it is available statewide. And again, these services have gone statewide in less, for less than six months. So we know there's going to be a lot of hiccups. And what I tell people is that please email me, let me know if something has worked out well or if something failed completely because we need to follow up and kind of look at what do we need to do differently. Is there additional funding that would help reach mobile quicker or need more mobile practitioners? So yes, it is statewide, absolutely. And can you speak to the cost of services? Oh, good question. Yes. So as we know, nothing is free. And so we don't ever tell consumers this is free. What is free is the phone. But what we tell people, and we're trying to encourage the languaging around the cost, is you will get seen regardless of your ability to pay. All the contractors have received funding to basically treat, assess, and, and stabilize people, stabilize folks when there's a crisis. However, they are also required to look at if someone has a private insurer like Kaiser or Anthem, or if someone has Medicaid, if there is a billing piece to it, they have to go ahead and do some back billing. Um, the reason for that is, is the way the laws are written in the state of Colorado, there's no way to wipe out everybody's co-payments, whether it's $20 or $50. Likely it's no different than when I go to Kaiser with a kidney stone and know that I will have a $150 copayment because I will not get admitted, I'll get some brief interventive treatment, and then I'll go home with a sieve. So again, those are all important things to tell people is that regardless of their ability to pay, they're not going to be billed for something. They're not going to be given a bill at the walk-in center or at the crisis stabilization unit or when a mobile practitioner comes. I know people have a lot of anxiety about utilizing services and being able to afford them. 
And one last question. Does the crisis services work directly with primary care providers to address the medical needs of individuals that show up? That show up? Yeah. So this is what I can tell you. Again, at every site, there's physician oversight. On site, you will have available nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs that will do brief histories, physicals. They are able to do some labs. They could do a Depakote level. They could, do, they could check a thyroid level. And most locations can get those back within four hours. But again, if something is more complicated medically, they would likely have to go to an ER. Again, if someone is disoriented, if we're not sure why they can't articulate who they are, where they are, what day it is, again, the sites are not equipped to do any kind of IV drugs. Um, the sites will eventually have stock meds, things like benzos, some opiates for pain. They will have emergency psychiatric meds as well. Some locations are still struggling with getting stock meds because depending on the license that they have through the health department, they've had to work with the Board of Pharmacy. So again, acute medical issues not going to be treated or probably referred out if there is something really acute. Chronic medical issues that are stable can likely be treated in respite as well as in a CSU, depending on what that is. The other piece I want to kind of make a point of is that the primary diagnosis is not the driving force for admission to a crisis bed or to a respite bed. These practitioners really start, it's a cultural shift because they have to look at what is the presentation. So if I'm a chronic marijuana user who has Medicaid, but I'm having a full-on panic attack, I can't pull it together, I can get referred to respite, I can get referred to a CSU bed. It doesn't matter that my primary diagnosis is marijuana abuse or marijuana dependence. So again, they can treat people with IDDD issues, somebody with a TBI. There's not automatic exclusionary criteria just because someone has a medical diagnosis or someone has a history of TBI. It really is about what is the person's presentation, what is their level of functioning, and what level of care or intervention are they needing. Okay, and one last question, um, just out of time concern so we can get to the upcoming segments. But um, can you speak to availability of beds? Yes. So um, the locations in the states that are, that are crisis stabilization units can have up to 16 beds. Some of them are managing 12 beds right now because of staffing, some staffing issues, but they cannot have over 16 beds because that throws their license into like the whole institution category. We also, in the Denver metro area, have two CSUs specific to child, to children and adolescents. And honestly, um, I have not heard that they've had to turn people away because again, if one location in a region is full, they can refer someone to a crisis stabilization bed somewhere else. So for example, if I show up in Aurora and they're, they're at capacity, but the consumer needs a crisis stabilization bed, they don't need locked in patient, they don't need an ATU, they're not quite appropriate for respite, they could call one of the other locations in their region. So in Littleton or in Westminster or in Lakewood um, to see if there's a bed available. So. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Mary. And now we will transition to the perspective in the Northeast. Deanna Ryerson will be presenting. Okay, hoping everybody can hear me. Um, thank you so much, Mary, for the nice overview of our system and our services. Um, if we can go to the next slide. I'd like to talk about how this affects the Northeast region primarily. So the program launched as a statewide initiative on December 1st, 2014. What that did is tie together existing resources in the region to the statewide initiative and build upon and enhance existing services. So the Northeast region, there's, the state is actually divided into about four regions and the Northeast is comprised of the RICO Region 2, which um, includes, <coughs> whoops, where's my slide? <laughs> it includes all of the Cheyenne, Kit Carson, like Lincoln, Logan, Morgan, Phillips, Sedgwick, Wesh Washington, Weld, and Yuma counties, as well as Elbert and, and Larimer County. So that is the Northeast Crisis Response Region. 
and the services are actually primarily provided by the three community mental health centers that cover that area. So North Range Behavioral Health, Centennial Mental Health Center and Touchstone Health Partners are the primary providers. One of the services, as Mary alluded to, is assessment and triage. So uh, some of these centers offered walk-in crisis support prior to December 1st. However, not many of them offered services 24-7 or 365 days a year. With the state funding, we now have that uh, increased availability to offer crisis assessment and triage 24-7. The two walk-in centers are located for the Northeast region in Greeley and Fort Collins, and those are, again are open all day, every day. And then we have six mobile teams that actually serve the entire 12 county region. Um, the mobile response does go into any county in our area and crosses the state um, wherever people need to be seen. In addition to that, Centennial Mental Health Center offices are open during business hours for any walk-in traffic for crisis assessment and triage. Assessment and triage services does include a full evaluation by a qualified and, ma and master's level mental health clinician who helps assess the crisis situation and determine next steps. Many situations are possible to resolve on scene or in the moment, so in addition to that assessment, you're also getting a clinician to help diffuse the situation de-escalate the client or family, offer a safety plan, and intervene with the crisis um, with trained techniques to help diffuse the situation and help the client or family stabilize. If higher level placement or referral to community-based services is needed, that is also offered at that time. So the services by referral after that evaluation, if someone needs a higher level care placement, um, we do have two new respite facilities, and again, that's staffed by paraprofessionals or peer support specialists and case managers, as well as administrative oversight. And the primary goal of our respite stays is to connect that person to existing services in the community, to hook them up with some sort of support system that will help triage or prevent any crises from happening in the future. So the two new respite facilities, one is in Greeley and one is in Sterling, and they have a total bed capacity for 16 beds. Again, the stay for respite episode is from 1 to 14 days. We also have an existing crisis stabilization unit, which is the CSU and detox facility in Greeley. And that has a combined 16 CSU bed and 23 detox bed capacity. Um, and so that facility has already been in existence prior to December 1st and continues to serve clients through this crisis response system. In addition to that, we will have a new crisis stabilization unit opening in the summer of 2015 in Fort Collins, and that is projected to have a 10-bed capacity at that CSU level. In addition to these 24-hour care services, we have added with the state funding some more transportation resources. This is important particularly for our rural communities where we can use our vans and our extra staff 24-7 to transport clients who are in crisis um, to those, those placement facilities or wherever they need to be going um, to stabilize in their crisis without having to rely unnecessarily on law enforcement and ambulance for transportation. Um, so that has been an incredibly helpful and useful resource for this region. So, in sum, the crisis response system has really helped enhance crisis services for the Northeast. We're able to serve more clients and more families with our 24-7 access um, and increased staff availability for behavioral health crisis. We're able to get out in the community, talk with providers, um, get the word out and see more members in the community and really help stabilize individuals without having them have to go to increased uh, placement options or higher level care. Uh, we're still working on trying to keep people out of the ERs um, and train the communities to come to us in our walk-in centers versus going to the ER, and we think that's going to just take some time. Um, but we certainly want to encourage clients who are appropriate to come to our walk-in centers or call us so we can send out a mobile team. In addition to that, we've really enhanced this continuum of care by providing a level of care that is in between inpatient psychiatric hospitalization and outpatient like, you know, mental health care. The respite, residential respite option for clients in crisis up to 14 days and the crisis stabilization option up to five days is really helping to enhance that whole continuum where people can be held pot potentially for a longer stay and help really stabilize before they have to go back into the community. The statewide collaboration and accountability is 
helping us to understand crisis services on a statewide continuum and where are the gaps in services, where do we need to beef up our existing resources. The data dashboard and the link is shown on the slide here is showing one of our examples of how our da data displays. We're holding held accountable in various ways. We have tracking statewide outcomes and each region is required to have a public-facing dashboard where we can display our outcomes in real-time data. So you're welcome to go into our website, see the crisis services in the Northeast and how we're doing with our outcomes. We're tracking various things <coughs> such as timeliness and response time to suicidality, presenting concerns, and how people are served in, in respite as well. One last comment on No Wrong Door. Uh, we want to partner with you. We want to hear from you what would be most helpful. So we have certain marketing materials to help get the word out. We would love to have you put them in your lobbies, uh, give them to clients, give them our phone number, and contact us for a tour. Help, under, help us understand how we can partner with you to best care for our clients and collaborate. So I've put my personal contact information up there for my direct line and access to the Northeast Behavioral Health Crisis Response System. Please give us a call if you have a need in your area and you would like to partner further. And if there's any questions, I can take them now. Yes, thanks Deanna. I do have two questions for you. Uh, okay. The first question is, where can we find the address for the two centers in Greeley and Port Collins? If you if you click on the link <laughs> in, in our dashboard, it's actually on the home page there, but I can give it to you now as well. Can we also talk about the Colorado Crisis Services main web page as well? Colorado Crisis website that Mary put up earlier shows the walk-in addresses for the whole state. And so you can find the walk-in center that's most closest to you or your client on that website. In addition, we have just the Northeast section displayed on our website and our two walk-in center addresses are listed there. So the one in, in Fort Collins um, is on 525 West Oak Street at the Touchstone Mental Health Center office. And that will be moving to Riverside once that opens in the summer. And the one in Greeley is located at 928 12th Street. And that is um, both on our website at the northeastbhs.org website. Excellent. Thanks, Deanna. And the second question is, well, it's half a comment, half a question. So it's difficult uh -huh. to imagine what type of clients meet the criteria. Can you give an example? It seems as if you have to be somewhat pretty stable, but not exactly. stable enough. Um, so what kind of criteria is best for our walk-in or mobile crisis response and starting the, the system there? So I think Mary made a great point. If you don't know where to turn, call our, our statewide hotline, that's a great resource to start. Um, if a client is depressed and having some suicidal thoughts or vague um, ideation possibly means, or, or a plan, but you're not sure exactly where they're headed with this and you would like some trained clinical eyes on that, then give us a call. Call the statewide hotline, call us. Um, we certainly would rather have you err on the side of caution and contact us and talk to us about the situation so that we can help you walk through the next steps. Um, clients who are most appropriate for walk-in I think need to be somewhat medically stable and that's the distinction I would make there. Um, and psychiatrically they can be all over the map. We've had people who have a manic episode, bipolar, depressed, psychotic, um, people who are I think aggressive and active, acting out, out of behavioral control. Um, unable to um, manage themselves would have to still go to the ED. But short of that, if someone is depressed, anxious, um, having a panic attack, those are all clients that would be appropriate for our walk-in or mobile response. We're, we're really trying to have a regional approach to this and a statewide approach really to crisis. So if you contact someone with Rocky Mountain Crisis Partners at that statewide hotline, they have my number and my contact information. You can still get in touch with me through them. Um, really, there's no wrong door. If you contact the hotline, if you call us, you walk into one of the provider's offices and you need our crisis materials, they all ha should be well stocked with our crisis materials and our phone numbers. Um, again, no wrong door. Contact the Community Mental Health Center in your area. Contact me, the hotline, 
we'll, we'll get you set up with what you need. Now, I do have a private practice, and sometimes I go out of state. Can I, um, on my voicemail, can I tell my patients to, if they're in need of emergency, that we can, I can give their phone, your phone number to them? Deanna, can I answer that? Can, can well, I answer yeah, that really I'll quickly? Go for it. And I was going to say we also have addressed that issue as a region. So I'll probably tag on to what Mary says. Go ahead. Yeah, so we are going to try to even reach out to Dora to see if people can put the statewide crisis line on their outgoing voicemail instead of the standard, please call 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. Because honestly, you just need to provide something. As a private practitioner, telling someone to go to the ER isn't any more CYA than saying call 844-893-TALK. So absolutely leave that number on the outgoing message if you're a private practitioner. That's a great thank you for bringing that up. Deanna, go ahead. I was going to, and I'll, let me just piggyback onto that because we have talked about that as a region and, you know, certainly it doesn't um, take you off the hook, if you will, if you're a private practitioner for developing a good safety net backup plan for clients when you're mm -hmm. out of the area. I think per DORA and your licensing agreement, you, you would want to make sure that you have a good backup plan for any clients should you be out of the area. And mm -hmm. our, our crisis line and our services are, are no more than like the, the 911 scenario or the ED in that situation. You would still need to take care of your clients and make sure that you're developing a good plan in that event. However, we want to make sure that you also have our phone number instead of 911 or in, in addition to 911 when that crisis is a behavioral health crisis in nature and not a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deanna. Um, let's move on to Mike's section. Um, and for those of you who had questions in that segment that didn't entirely get answered, you are free to email me directly with those questions. We will be compiling a question and answer list that will also accompany the slides and the link to the recording following today's webinar. So Mike Tapp, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the Director of Crisis Services at Aurora Mental Health. And go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, this is Mike Tapp. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the South Denver region. Um, thanks to Mary, Deanna, and Marissa for being here with me today. Um, just to kind of go over, this is very crucial, I think, for for crisis intervention this, um, statewide. Um, the first slide you're going to see is the South Denver metro region. Um, you'll see um, seven walk-in clinics uh, across a uh, nine-county area. Um, pretty impressive collaboration between uh, Jefferson Center for Mental Health, Boulder Mental Health Partners, Community Reach Center, Rapa Douglas Mental Health Center, Mental Health Corporation of Denver, and then Aurora Mental Health, of course. Um, next slide. Uh, in, in our region, we, we do have uh, six walk-in clinics, um, five crisis stabilization units, as Mary said. Uh, three of those serve the over-18 population, uh, uh, and the other two serve uh, the under-18 population. So in, in essence, we have 48 adult beds and 16 under-18 beds um, throughout our region. We also have six mobile crisis teams uh, across, again, the six mental health centers. Specific to Aurora, you know, I kind of want to drill down and just give you a few numbers, kind of what we're seeing and what some of the impressive uh, features are of, of these uh, different services. The walk-in center um, at Aurora Mental Health, um, we're seeing about 12 or 15 encounters a day. Certainly we could see uh, many more, so we would appreciate your referrals. Um, as Mary was saying, these are client-defined crises. Uh, trauma-informed. I think one of the more salient pieces is that um, if, if someone walks into an emergency room, uh, you know, by tradition, they're going to get seen by a medical doctor, a nurse, uh, or a nurse practitioner. Uh, probably they're going to wait multiple hours, maybe more than four hours before that mental health professional gets there. Uh, there's probably a lot of unnecessary screenings that go on medically prior to that. So with the walk-in center, you're going to see uh, a consortium of peer specialists, case managers, and uh, unlicensed and licensed clinicians within five or ten minutes. So I think, you know, in terms of uh, risk management for physical health providers, crisis managers, um, you know, get, get the folks into that service. I think we could do more immediate work with, with a person in, in that five or ten minute um, uh, wait time. It also prevents needless uh, ER uses, as everyone else kind of talked about. 
and we need everyone's help in that process. Um, at the Aurora CSU, you know, as mentioned, and this is uh, fairly consistent across the state, I believe, 16 bed facilities, um, one to five days uh, folks are being ad admitted for. Uh, specific to Aurora, since December 1st, we've had over 250 admissions. So if you extrapolate that into bed days, our average length of stay is about 3.8. You know, that's, that's uh, way over 1,000 bed days that we've, that we've at least managed, um, you know, at the community um, uh, clinic license, which I think is pretty impressive. Uh, certainly we, we can do a lot more. Our census in Aurora has, has uh, pretty much stabilized between 8 and 10 persons a day. We have 16 beds. So, um, you know, in, you know, in relationship with the other two crisis stabilization units in the region, you know, I think that we can, we can take all comers at this point, um, you know, for that appropriate uh, client. Uh, last thing I want to say is, uh, you know, Aurora, of course, we have a mobile crisis team. Um, one thing that I think is impressive about mobile crisis teams across the state is that we meet clients in the best and least restrictive location. Think about this. Um, you know, we can go to residences, we can go to churches, schools, uh, you know, business locations, or even just, uh, you know, common, common locations in the community that we're called to. These, uh, again, like Mary was saying, these are trauma-informed uh, interventions. If the police um, and fire and, and first responders don't need to be there, we don't take them out with us. If we feel like there's some kind of escalation that needs to be covered, we'll still send a mobile crisis clinician out to your location or the clinic, uh, location we know about. I think that's uh, briefly what I wanted to get to. You know, there's been an alarming increase in the last three, more, three or four months in terms of ER visits. I think that that might be a marketing piece, but, you know, we really need um, providers' help in getting folks to the golden funnel is what I call it, and that's uh, getting people who are in a behavioral health crisis uh, to an immediate resource, which is our walk-in clinics and our mobile crisis teams. Any questions, I, I feel free to fill them. We'll turn the time over to Marissa and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, so we'll pause on the questions for now and use the last seven minutes for the Denver piece, and then at the end, for those who have time, we can field um, those questions then. Marissa? Okay, thank you, Mike. I am Marissa Vandover, and I'm the program manager of the Denver Walk-In Center. Um, in Denver, we have four components of the Colorado Crisis Services, including um, the hotline like everybody else, and um, we have mobile crisis, the walk-in center, and respite beds. Um, as you can see in that slide, there's two pictures of the walk-in center. We're currently serving clients of all ages. We're equipped to deal with um, infants to elderly who are walking in the doors. We are also working with MHCD consumers and members of the general community. I've had a few people say, well, I didn't think somebody could come there unless they were part of MHCD. So Mental Health Center of Denver is operating this clinic, but it is open to the general public. Um, it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, providing immediate care, connections to ongoing mental health treatment, and referrals to resources in the community. The walk-in center is staffed by two licensed clinicians, a registered nurse, a peer specialist, an administrative assistant, and a member of our safety team. So Mary talked about this a little bit earlier, um, when to go to the walk-in center and when to go to the emergency room. But just to reiterate here, um, if you're having an acute medical crisis, you would go to the emergency room. If you're having acute drug or alcohol intoxication, you would also go to the emergency room. We do not have a medical doctor on site, nor is the walk-in center prepared to manage withdrawal. Um, and also, if you've already been placed on a mental health hold, you would go to the emergency room. Um, for anybody else who's having a behavioral health crisis that does not meet those three points above, you would come on into the walk-in center. So these are some pictures of the Denver Walk-In Center just to give you an idea. So like I said before, it is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When someone walks in the door, they are um, checked in by a member of the safety team. And that first picture there is a picture of our lobby. Then the client is brought back um, and checked in with the nurse for vitals and a basic health history before they're brought to a private room where they can relax and meet with a clinician. In that room is where the client will have the opportunity to meet with a licensed clinician and a peer specialist who both have experience handling emotional crisis. 
Um, at the walk-in center, services are provided in a warm and welcoming, supportive community setting. And services can be started by just walking in the doors or by calling the hotline who can help connect you with us. So what happens next? Um, after a person leaves the walk-in center, they may just return to the community. The person may be feeling better. A referral may be made um, to follow up services into the community. A client may also be referred to respite, or they could be referred to an out-of-county crisis stabilization unit. So Denver doesn't have crisis stabilization unit beds within the county, but they are partnered with the other metro area organizations where they can access the crisis stabilization unit beds. And at times, we do have to transfer somebody from the walk-in center to an emergency department, either on a hold or on a voluntary basis if they need um, that level of care or um, medical care at that time. Another component of this system is respite care. So in Denver County, the respite beds are located at Park Place. So this is for a person who needs a little bit longer to stabilize. Um, where they may, you know, be at the WIC for a few hours, the walk-in center for a few hours, and then may need to be at a place for up to seven days. Um, this could be for people who are MHCD consumers or um, members of the community. And during that time, if a person is not connected to services, an intake can be done for mental health treatment um, at the Mental Health Center of Denver for ongoing care. Questions? So I did get a couple questions. Can you speak to the function of a peer specialist? Identify who is a peer. Sure. So a peer specialist, and anybody jump in here if you have something to say that would add. Um, a peer specialist is a person with lived experience. So the function of our peer specialist in the walk-in center, well, really they do, they do a lot of things. But one thing that they can do that a clinician can't do is is to walk in and tell somebody, you know, hey, I, I've been where you've, where you've been, I've experienced this, um, here's the resources that really helped me. So we look at them um, as sort of experts in the field from their experience, in addition to being experts on community resources that they can help provide clients with that come in. Yeah, and this is Mike. I would add to that. Um, so in Aurora, uh, what we did is a couple years back uh, in anticipation of, of some of these new programs, uh, we developed a peer university. And so our first cycle was uh, about 30 individuals who went through a 10-month training process where they, they had seminar and supervision and training modules, everything from how to have effective boundaries, um, ethics of, of client care, charting, documentation, um, and just you know all those all those things that come up for uh, providers that that either enhance or um, limit care. Um, so statewide, I know there's other modules for peer specialists, and and even at the um, state level, they've talked about clinical peer specialty, what that would look like to take it to a new level. These um, the folks that we have had on our crisis teams for the last two and a half years, uh, very seasoned. We've used them in terms of. Um, someone who's waiting in an emergency room to, to go and, and do some uh, visits and conversation and, and normalize um, the process as best as we could. So they're used in the walk-in clinics as well as sometimes the, the, the first responder, um, you know, and, and can really help with de-escalation and, and, you know, getting someone in, into that right moment where, where a clinical assessment can, can start to mature. Excellent, thank you. And then the next question is, are there multilingual, bilingual um, counselors available at the crisis center? So there are. At times we do have to um, call for an interpreter or um, we might have to utilize the language line, but we are equipped to be ready to help people speaking any language, um, including sign language. Same, same for Aurora. We, we do have some on-site um, Spanish-speaking providers in our, in our walk-in center center and our mobile crisis team, so, you know, every, every way we're trying to uh, enhance that service, um, we're doing it as possible. And this is Deanna. I would say the same is true for our region and our walk-in centers, that we have some bilingual or trained providers with different languages, um, but we may also have to access the language line or an interpreter. Um, and we utilize peers much in the same way. And in fact, I would say that some of the respite facility stays and our client feedback is that the peers have made um, 
a very strong impact on some of the members staying there, and they, you know, really helped in helping stabilize the situation as well as connect to resources and provide that motivation for someone who's really at that balance point of whether they're going to relapse or not and motivating them to keep going. So it's been a, a tremendous asset to our program. Um, one last comment before we finish the webinar, I know we're running out of time here, about how to use Colorado Crisis Services in your practice. Um, we want to have help spreading the word, if you will, and make sure that you get our signage, our cards, um, the Colorado Crisis phone number out there in your lobbies and offer the phone numbers to clients and people that you work with in your community. As um, I think we said, it's open to anyone in need. Update your web pages and your literature with our phone numbers or our addresses and help us decrease unnecessary ED usage. I think we've talked a lot about how medical emergencies still need to go to the ED. However, psychiatric emergencies, if you will, can come to our walk-in centers or call the crisis line. Um, and we, we hope that we continue to collaborate with physical, mental, or physical health providers in order to get screening or physical screening, um, talk screens, et cetera, whenever we need to make a placement to a higher level care and without having to go to an emergency room just to get a talk screen. And so we're continuing to work out the bugs in that process. Um, help us with joint treatment plans and identifying those clients that come in frequently for our services with comorbid or chronic physical and mental health issues. We want to partner with their agencies in the community and make sure that we're addressing those needs on a preventative basis. We're very open to tours. In fact, our Greeley facility, of which one of the pictures was of our Greeley facility here, um, has uh, you know, routine tours. Every month they give a tour of the walk-in and respite facility. And call us if you want more information, and we can be helpful to you. Excellent. I have one question around how do I get marketing materials? So the Colorado website that was up earlier has an ability to download the, the brochure as well as a business card with the hotline number on it. And our marketing materials for Northeast are available for each county specific. Um, so Centennial Mental Health Center, North Range Mental Health Center, and Touchstone Health Partners our all marketing materials can be reached through our regional marketing person and myself. So I know I put my contact information up there, and I don't think I have our marketing contact information on the slides, but certainly if you call me, we can put, get you pointed in the right direction. And I just I can add to that, if some of you want um, even just calling cards, business cards, you can email me, and depending on where you're located, I can connect you also to the right marketing group because that is broken down into regions. So my email address is given. Please email me, and I'd be happy to figure that out with you. And that was Mary. And that's Mary. All right, you guys. So we are nearing the end of the webinar. Thank you all for those who have participated and submitted questions. So it does look like we don't have anyone who's indicated that they no longer know what it is <laughs> and that they are not familiar. So thank you all for participating and asking questions. Um, feel free to email myself, this is Sheba, um, or Mary, or Mike, or Deanna with questions, and Marissa as well. Um, but all of the materials following this webinar will be coming from me. Uh, my email. So I hope to send you guys something hopefully in the next couple weeks or so. In the meantime, feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you again. Bye, everybody.